Hello question. and welcome to today's Keeping Current. Today we have uh, Dr. Jacobs, Dr. Nathan Jacobs, talking about some of the work he's doing with deep machine learning. And uh, um, Dr. Finkel couldn't join us today. He had another uh, engagement that he had to attend. But we want to thank you all for showing up. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jacobs. Awesome. OK, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, and yeah, so the talk that I'm going to give today is um, you know, redoing a talk that I gave in January to a group of um, it's a transportation engineering group. It was a new audience that I've never presented to before um, of people that were mostly not machine learning uh, or computer science um, experts. Um, and so this is, this is uh, you know, I've expanded that talk a little bit, but I've, you know, basically kept true to what I presented then. Um, and this is basically the, the result of uh, the work of a couple of fantastic master's students, uh, William and Armin, and a, sort of a, a running collaboration with the Kentucky Transportation Center at Mei Chen in particular. And she may be able to join in here at some point. Um, but the, the motivation, um, hold on, let me move this so I can see the screen. Um, I mean, so the motivation of this work, I think, is, is stronger than the motivation for, for some of the papers, uh, some of the work that I've done in the past. Uh, you know, essentially, you know, what we're trying to do is address some fundamental problems with the transportation infrastructure of this country um, and across the world. Um, you know, there's a staggering cost in terms of lives and um, economic cost as well. Uh, for roadway crashes. Um, and it's the leading cause of death in the United States for children and young adults, so ages five to 29. Um, and it's, so it's a major problem. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, you know, I enjoy is trying to find ways to make the work that I do in computer vision be applicable to, to real world problems like this. Um, and so this is one, you know, I've got a number of collaborations that are, you know, along the lines of this, um, but yeah, so this is one of them. Um, and so just to set the stage a little bit, this is a picture, this is a map of the south side of Indianapolis. Um, and what it shows is that the roads are color coded by who owns the particular road. So who's responsible for maintaining it? Who's responsible for assessing the safety of that road? Um, and so these are, you know, transportation agencies or organizations, you know, essentially their their job is, to you know, understand the roads that they're responsible for and make improvements to them. Um, and sometimes that's just you know, resurfacing the road and sometimes that may be more dramatic changes. Um, and so in the end, what the work that we're doing here, I see you know, these are the organizations that are essentially the target for this work that we're doing. These transportation agencies that might have you know, tens of thousands of roadway miles that they're responsible for maintaining um, and they need to, to understand them. Uh, and so in particular, we're, we're focused on roadway safety. Um, and one of the you know, standard approaches to assessing the safety of a road is this um, international road assessment program. It's called IRAP. Uh, and essentially what they do is they, they either send somebody to the site or they have somebody look at Google Street View essentially, and they look at the road and they, they assess it. And so they look for things like, is there a physical median um, is there, you know, a large rock on the right-hand side of the road? Um, does the roadway surface look rough? Um, all these sorts of things. Um, and so there's a, you know, there's a whole bunch of these different things that, I, you know, somebody looking at that would do. And then in addition, that all of that information gets distilled down into a score. Um, and it's a star rating. And so on the left, you see an example of a panorama of a one-star road. So this is a, you know, not a particularly safe place to drive. And on the right is a, a five-star road. It has, you know, all of the standard safety features. And then in the end, you would expect that, you know, it might be safer to drive on that five-star road. Um, so, so these are just some examples. So this is a, you know, the star rating, it, you know, it ranges from one to five. Um, you know, it roughly indicates the likelihood and severity of a crash happening on that road. So a, a lower star road is, uh, you know, fewer stars means more dangerous. Um, and those are just some examples of the things that I've already mentioned. Um, so in addition to roadway features, right? So, you know, whether it has a physical median or how wide the lanes are, you know, in addition, how, how people use the road is an important factor in how safe it is. Um, 
And so just simple things like reducing, you know, the speed can lead to significant reductions in the number of, of fatalities. Um, and the way people decide to drive on a particular segment of road is are, for example, lots of cars on the side of the road, people tend to drive more slowly. And so these are things, uh, you know, this is called traffic calming, where they might decide to do something to the road to encourage people to drive more slowly, which will make it safer for pedestrians and cyclists and for, you know, people in other vehicles. Um, so these two factors that, you know, the, the physical properties of the road and how people use the road are important in determining how safe a particular segment of road is. And so that's the focus of this talk, um, is sort of trying to automate the assessment of those, those features. Um, so current practice, you know, you can see here in the bottom right corner, um, you know, you've got people sitting there looking at the road and making all sorts of annotations of these to try to, to understand it. Um, and that involves potentially going out into the field and collecting data first. And it's a very long, involved, and expensive process. And so it means that a particular road segment is probably not going to be evaluated that frequently. Uh, so there's a significant manual effort. It leads to bad information, uh, which drives decisions uh, that might be incorrect. Um, and so you can think of this a little bit like the, the US Census, where we, you know, we want to know where everybody lives so that we can make policy decisions at a government level. So this is the equivalent of that, in essence, for the, the roadway system. Um, so in addition, one of the things that I think is a ma major limitation is this reliance, you know, a lot of these approaches because they're sort of traditional in nature to make these star rating predictions are based on very simple roadway geometric attributes that are easy to measure. So what's the curvature of the road? What is exactly the lane width? Um, and so these uh, features are collected differently in different places. It's sort of not a standardized process necessarily. And so you, you, you essentially have to rebuild models for different places because that information may or may not be available. It may be slightly different. Um, and so those are you know, a couple of the problems that we you know, would like this work to be able to address. So in the end, we have two tasks that we're addressing, this roadway safety assessment task. And this is just, a, this is a preliminary picture of what that's going to look like in the end. We're going to have a, a panorama that was collected by vehicle sort of driving quickly through that area. Um, we're going to pass that through some convolutional neural network, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we're going to predict the star rating. And in addition, we'll predict these other attributes. Um, for the free flow speed, it looks essentially the same. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we can use satellite imagery to predict the free flow speed. So, um, but, but in essence, these are different neural network architectures that are tailored to the particular task. So just sort of backing up a little bit. So I've, you know, I've got convolutional neural networks here as the building block for both of these approaches. So I thought it was worthwhile uh, to, to talk briefly about those. Um, so in the end, um, convolutional neural networks are one of the best building blocks for image understanding tasks. And so those tasks might be image classification, right? So you know, on the left is that, you know, that's an image of somebody riding a go-kart. Um, and so it's an image level label um, discrete label that describes what's in that scene. Um, and on the right, you, you can see the image segmentation task. So this is, you know, for every pixel labeling what that pixel is looking at, you know, whether it's a bicycle or a person or, or a road. Um, in the end, both of these tasks, and there are several other very common um, image understanding tasks, the, the dominant approach you know, today is, is by and large, it's going to be a convolutional neural network. If you see something that's working really well, to, to solve one of these kinds of problems. It's going to be a convolutional neural network. Um, and so in essence, what our work is doing is, is taking all of this innovation that's happened in terms of convolutional neural networks and adapting it to this task. Um, going back to the very beginning, uh, you, know, you know, what is a convolutional neural network and kind of why, why it's a good thing? Um, I, uh, this is one of my, my favorite slides. Um, so I figured I'd just throw this in here. Um, so we can think about having sort of an image understanding task. We'd like to classify this image as you know, what it contains. And that's an easy task for us, um, but it's a really hard task to write code to do. Um, and so a very traditional approach you know, might be to, to write some very complicated code that, you know,
I write some very complicated code, fit a very simple linear model. And you might call this sort of a non-machine learning approach. Um, although, you know, maybe there's a little bit of what we've called machine learning here at the end. Um, and typically, you know, if we haven't, if we take an approach like that, we can't say very much. We might be able to write code that is okay at classifying whether there's an animal in the picture or not, uh, as long as it's a really big picture of an animal. Um, but we probably can't say much more fine grained than that. So sort of through the 2000s through 2012 or so, this row here was sort of the dominant approach in the in image understanding. So the idea here was to write some much simpler code. So people would write something that was much simpler um, and then they would have these richer machine learning models sitting on that, on top of that. And so with that, we, we have the ability to use large data sets to determine what goes into that machine learning model. So to solve for those parameters. Um, and then we can predict things and uh, you know that gives us potentially the ability to say more fine grained things. Like we know this is a dog versus a cat. Um, there's still quite a bit of a reliance on human written code, um, but there's more of it that's learned automatically from data. Um, and then, so this is basically, you, you know, the 2012 until now uh, in computer vision has been essentially passing raw pixels into our machine learning model. Um, and we, you know, we call that deep learning, um, but it's essentially just a bigger machine learning model. Um, and for the most part in computer vision, those have been convolutional neural networks. So if you hear deep learning, um, probably what that means is a deep convolutional neural network. Um, if somebody's talking about doing image understanding, um, might be different for different domains, but that's that's the dominant approach there. Um, and here we might be able to say more fine grained things like this is a golden retriever puppy, right? Um, and so this is just sort of a cartoon that sort of gets a picture of what's what's been happening you know, over the last 20, uh, 25 years in the, the field of computer vision that led to these models that are called convolutional neural networks. Um, so those models are essentially consisting of a sequence of layers that are very simple. And these are often illustrated by, you know, these sort of slab diagrams where you can think of this first slab as potentially representing the image. If you just took that image and it was kind of thick because it had red, green, and a blue channel, then you rotated that a little bit sideways. So you had three channels of that. Then that goes through a very simple operation, which is not shown here, but there's a simple operation that takes place between here, a convolution, which essentially looks locally at the input image and computes something to generate for the output. Um, and then you stack a bunch of these convolutional layers and a few other layers that add nonlinear elements together. Um, and then you can push the image through that, getting these intermediate feature maps um, to get some predicted label that comes out. You have some true label, you compute the error between the predicted label and the true label. And then you push back through the model. You say, all right, model, you made some mistakes. This is the mistake that you made fix yourself and the model updates itself the parameters inside of it to to do a better job at making the prediction on this example um, in a little bit more detail what that looks like might be something like this where we have an image coming in um, and here we have a sequence of of layers these are equivalent to those slabs on the previous slide except just shown as little boxes but we have these boxes going through with the convolutions that are taking place. We have here some weights that define what computation is happening here. We push this through the model. We compute the loss, which is basically comparing the label that it predicted and the label that we should have predicted. So that's what we call the forward pass through the model. We get a real value out of that. That's the error, the loss that the model makes for that particular example. And then we back propagate through to compute um, the updates that we should make to the model parameters. And so for a given input example and a given label for that example, we get an update that is to, to make to our model parameters. And in the end, that's a partial derivative computation. So if you're familiar with you know, derivatives and partial derivatives, essentially this is just, you know, there are nice ways to compute that efficiently. Um, by taking advantage of the structure of this network. Um, and so this is, you know, the very basic, um, you know, overview of what a convolutional neural network is. Everything beyond that, th there's a lot beyond that that is essentially just small increments of improvement 
over that basic concept. But I think if you understand this basic concept, then the rest of it sort of falls into place. Um, but there's, you know, years and years worth of study that you could look into the different architectures. Um, this is a, you know, a picture, a little bit of the a recent history of convolutional neural networks from one of my favorite websites. Um, this is Papers with Code, which shows you, you know, for a given computer vision or, or other task data set, um, what is the state of the art at a particular time? So what's the best performing method for this data set at a particular point in time? And then also provides links to the code for that. So it makes it really easy to, to implement things that are at the state of the art. Um, and so here you can see the, the sort of most famous computer vision data set uh, of, this, of this era is the ImageNet data set. It's an image classification task. Um, and you can see sort of 2011, we had SIFT plus FVs. Um, I didn't actually look, but I'm guessing that's Fisher vectors and SIFT is a, you know, equivalent to, is a, is a, is a way of extracting features that's manually created. Um, and so this is, this represents that middle row of the, the puppy slide that I showed before. Um, was this approach. And then here, um, you know, we can sort of see the frontier of the state of the art slowly improving over time. You know, the accuracy going up uh, as the years go on. Um, and these are now convolutional neural networks that are at sort of the frontier of the best performing method over time. Um, and so you can see a huge amount of improvement where, um, you know, we go from, you know, 65% um, accuracy up to close to, you know, sort of 85 or 90 over here today. Um, and so uh, we're, we're not going to talk about this today, but, um, you know, this is something to watch out for in the future is that there are, are new approaches called the sort of transformers is the, the title that the, the name that's used to represent that whole group that were, you know, more popular in the natural language processing world. Um, earlier, um, but are now starting to become the best performing models for computer vision tasks. Although there are some downsides, they might take a little bit longer to train. And I think there's a whole lot of interesting work that's going to be done combining transformers and convolutional neural networks over the next four or five years to you know, push the numbers up and to push the computational costs down. Um, but this is on one data set, you know, sort of you can see that the trend over the last few years where all of the best methods uh, essentially are convolutional neural networks. Um, this is on a semantic segmentation task. Once again, so this only goes back to January uh, 2015. Um, so these are essentially all convolutional neural networks um, are, are the best performing methods for this uh, cityscape segmentation task. So this is like a street level image segmentation um, task. But once again, the same same sort of basic flavor. You can see things slowly getting better, and often these things are coupled. So you might see from the you know somebody over here might have you know invented something called DPN one thirty one in two thousand late two thousand sixteen, and then that might have gotten factored into some other model for this task over here. So you can basically take these models as building blocks and use those for other tasks. And so a lot of what we'll show is this sort of process of taking some existing building blocks and feeding them in. And then what you see over the last few years is that essentially a lot of the improvement flows out of this particular data set. So people will you know, see that you know, ResNext 101 is now the best method. And so now if you take that model and use it for some other task, that's going to improve all sorts of other tasks because it's a really good building block. Um, so that's one of the things that's been happening in the last few years. Um, I thought this was interesting. I was kind of hunting for uh, one that went back a little bit further. And this is as far back as I could go in time from this website. So, you know, the, it shows how short the, the mental time horizon is on the field right now that 2008 seems like eons ago. And this is the oldest date that I could find on that Papers with Code website. Um, but basically what this is, is it's an interesting data set because uh, the STL 10 data set has a small number of labeled examples. It's not nearly as big as ImageNet, but it has a huge number of labeled examples uh, of unlabeled examples. And so it's not quite as, as simple as a, as a bunch of labeled examples from the other data sets. Um, but you can see, you know, different names of methods. So receptive fields or some product networks or multitask Bayesian optimization. So essentially these are all very different methods that somebody was able to show improved things. And all of a sudden, you know, 
2015 era, people started using these convolutional neural networks that were largely being, uh, you know, the innovation was being driven by this ImageNet data set. They so started sort of finding ways to factor unsupervised examples. Um, and so that's why you don't see some of the same names from the other slide because um, these are using those building blocks, um, but you know, had to put extra special sauce on top of it to make it work. So anyway, that was, uh, I, I thought it was you know, useful to do a little bit of a, a divergence since this was a, a more CS audience than the last one. Um, but, but after this, I will dive back into the, the original talk that I promised you. And I'll say that I, um, I'm happy to take questions uh, as we go, if you want, or, or just to wait till the end. And I'm, I'm not seeing the chat at this point. So if there's anything coming up there, if somebody, if somebody feels like it, they need, I need to be interrupted to answer something, please, please feel free to do that. Okay. So basic outline for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the automated uh, roadway safety assessment work, and then a little bit about the free flow speed assessment work. Um, so recall that the idea here was for the first part is, you know, we want to estimate the star rating for a particular segment of road. We're going to use the panoramic image of that road uh, as the, the input to the model. Um, and so just to establish a baseline, we might build something that looks like this, where we have a panorama that goes in. We've got a convolutional neural network architecture that we can basically break into three parts. There's a feature extraction component, which you know extracts some description of each little part of the image. Then we have a dimensionality. This might be an example of that, sort of breaking it down to concrete things. So in this particular work, we used the, what's called the VGG architecture. This is actually a really old architecture that we, you know, we could probably get some performance gains. Uh, and I guess I'll show you in a little bit that we, we can by replacing this piece. But this was you know, from 2018. I th think we probably did this work in 2017. So it's um, you know, a little bit of an older architecture. But in the end, it's a feature extraction network. Um, Global average pooling is a really simple operation. We just average all of the feature values um, in terms of every, you know, every image location will have a vector that describes it. So we basically average the first element of all the vectors across the image, then average all the second elements. So we get this um, average vector for the image. And then here we'll just have a, a dense neural network layer. Um, basically it's a matrix multiplication for that vector to give us the star rating probabilities. So this would be a, a fairly, you know, standard baseline architecture that you might use for this. Using this, we get about 43% accuracy for the star rating distribution prediction task. Um, so not terrible, um, you know, 20% would be about average or would be a random performance. Um, so we're better than random, uh, but still not great. Um, so essentially this work proposed three strategies to try to improve this number. Um, so one of the strategies was to do some spatial attention that was uh, learned. And so instead of just taking the image features and averaging them naively across the whole image, you know, it seems like for, you know, maybe different parts of the image are more important. So, you know, the features of that look straight up at the sky and the panorama or straight down at the road might not be as important as ones that are right in front of the driver or right to the left or the right. Um, so essentially we get to learn a mask that does a, that learns how to do a weighted average pooling. But basically not, not a lot of extra computation, um, but gives it some more flexibility um, to learn that. So that's one of the, the small things that we added. We also um, added multitask learning. So instead of just predicting the um, star rating, we also predict all of the other roadway attributes that were collected. So what's the lane width, what's the curvature, what's the area type and so on. Uh, there are quite a few of those. And so essentially then we have a shared feature extraction model, which gives us this feature vector here or this feature map here. And then for each of these separate tasks, we have a, a unique attention mask 
that determines where we should look in the image if we want to predict that thing. Um, and so um, that's actually really if they were to swerve off the road in that direction. So what you'll see here is a panorama and then yellow regions in this heat map at the right reflect regions that get higher right over here is the driver's side. Um, that's where we, you know, when we average our features, we average mostly content from that part of the image. Um, and so we get a different uh, feature map, uh, attention map like this for each of the tasks here. So there's a distinct one for each of these. Um, and so that, that, you know, that gives the model a little bit of flexibility so that it doesn't have to come up with a single feature map that is generically useful for all of these separate tasks. Um, we also added an unsupervised learning element. So the, the basic, you know, one of the fundamental problems with this task was that the data set that we had to work with was actually fairly small by um, you know, image computer vision, modern computer vision terms, uh, you know, it's quite small. So what we wanted to be able to do is to, to use more images. And so we, we made this assumption that within, you know, 10 or 15 meters along a given segment of road, it's probably going to get the same star rating, right? Um, so, so what that allows us to do is to randomly sample pairs of panoramas from wherever we want and use those as input, right? Um, so we can then pass those through our network. You know, so these are two nearby panoramas. Right? We can pass those through our network. All of these are the same feature extraction network, the same shared features here, do the same weighted pooling, and then essentially say that the, you know, the Kramer distance is, is one potential distance metric. There's a lot that we could throw in there, but that's what we ended up using that says these two things should have the same safety rating. So what's really nice about that is that we can then have essentially an infinite number of examples that we could pass through our network and train with. Um, so we're not limited to the small training data set that we, we were given. So in the end, you know, this is our, when we say we compute the error, the, this is the loss function. You know, this is how we measure whether the, the network is making mistakes or not. We have a, a loss associated with the star rating. We have a multitask loss, which is a sum over all of those separate multitask uh, tasks and then the unsupervised loss. Um, and so there's, a, there's more details there, but um, you know, fairly standard stuff that happened in that component. Um, so we have a data set that we trained on with you know, a little over 7,000 panoramas, 23 different attributes in addition to the star rating, you know, fairly standard uh, training and test split. We also got um, you know, a relatively small number of unlabeled panorama pairs. Um, and then the training process was fairly standard. We, we used TensorFlow, which is a popular library for implementing things like this and fairly standard optimization settings. This is an evaluation that shows how the various um, components that we added impact the accuracy. So here's this 4306 is the baseline model that I showed at the beginning. If we just add the attention, we get a very, very small bump. If we just add the multitask learning, we get also a very small bump. Um, but we start seeing bigger gains when uh, you know, it seems like the most important thing is to have attention plus multitask learning together. That seems like where some of the biggest bump in performance comes. But if we add all the pieces together, we get you know close to 47% accuracy. Um, so that's a nice improvement with just a few tweaks to the model architecture uh, to be a little bit more focused on the task. The, the initial baseline is you know, would be a, just a generic, let's just throw the off the shelf model at this. Um, and so with some tuning and improvement to the architecture, we can you know, achieve a nice bump in performance without you know, requiring any additional manual annotation effort. So that's a nice, a nice small win. Um, but I think that the key here is that 
we could improve these results quite a bit by just getting additional data, right? So this is to some extent that then the actual, the raw numbers here are limited by the, the availability of training data. Um, and so this is a place where, you know, this project is kind of, it's hit a point now where we have a proof of concept and we're trying to find, you know, partners to either help fund it or provide additional data so that we can expand that. This is the confusion matrix for our best method. So the way to read this is um, for each row, we have the true label. So if this is a five star road, this is the distribution over the labels that our model would predict. So 77% of the time it predicts, you know, if it is a five star road, it predicts that it's a five star road. So what you'd like to see is that everything is along the diagonal is, is blue and then everything off the diagonal is one and blue and then off the diagonal is, is white and zero, which isn't the case, um, but it's fairly close to being along the diagonal, which is nice. So we don't have a lot of really egregious errors here. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that our model over predicts twos and threes. So if we have a one or a two star road, it's likely to predict it as you know something a little bit higher. Uh, and this is actually just, uh, you know, we looked into this a little bit and I think it's just an artifact of the data set. There were not a lot of one star roads in the data set. So we had to work pretty hard to prevent it from just always predicting three actually. Um, so that was one of the little things that actually, you know, doesn't show up in the slides or in the presentation, but took quite a while to figure out how to get the model to work. So it didn't just always predict three. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's largely a limitation with that, the scale of the data set. We showed how we could use this for a safety aware vehicle routing application. So the idea here is that you might, you know, go into Google Maps and you're, you know, maybe you're you're not feeling like a, a risk taker today and you've got time to spare. And so you would, you know, essentially say, I want to go the safest route from point A to point B. Um, and so we actually implemented this um, in a routing engine and you know, took Street View panoramas along there, labeled all of them automatically, and then we were able to then put in you know, if we ignore the safety ratings of the particular road, it sends us down this road here, which, you know, has lots of problems that's not very safe. And then if we tell it we want to take the safe route, it, it actually routes us over here on this road with a nice physical median and quite a bit safer, um, which I can imagine, um, you know, as a parent, it might be nice to be able to force my kids' phones to only be able to take the, the safe road. Okay, so um, that's the end of this first part where we're talking about the, you know, the safety assessment component. Um, so I wanted to jump now to the free flow speed assessment part of the work. Uh, a lot, there's gonna be a lot of similar elements here, but it is a, it's a different task and, a, you know, different, different inputs. Um, so free flow speed is this, uh, you know, concept, you know, it's essentially it's how fast people would drive on a segment of road if there was no bad weather, if there's no congestion, it's sort of the, the traffic is flowing freely, how fast will people drive? Um, and it's not that every individual will drive the same speed, but you, you know, want to think about the average, the average individual, how would they drive on that segment of road? That basically reflects how comfortable people feel driving down that road. Um, and lots of factors influence that. Um, but here at the right, you'll see this is a, you know, an interstate uh, highway, maybe the speed limit is 55 in this location, maybe the free flow speed is 66, because people feel comfortable driving a little bit faster than the speed limit in this place. Um, so there are current approaches to estimating this that basically look at you know, factors like the number of lanes, the lane width, you know, what is the speed limit? Um, to then you know, have a fairly simple model that makes a prediction. So what we're trying to do is to do this as much as possible from raw data so that we don't have to rely on some of these, um, these other things that might become out of date um, or maybe not even be available for a given segment of road. So we, we started with this um, free flow speed data set that uh, we were given uh, that um, Mei Chen was able to provide and help us understand. Um, so it's, it's data from a company called Here. They basically have um, you know, GPS um, units on vehicles and they drive around. And so this might be your, you know, your GPS navigation, right? So that's gonna record a trace that might end up in a data set like this. 
And so essentially what they do is they record GPS traces of people driving around uh, just in their daily lives. And then they aggregate that based on time of day um, and the day of the week to get you know, different free flow speed distributions or speed distributions for different times of day. So you can see here the, the distribution over speeds here across the state of Kentucky, um, you know, distribution over different types of areas, the speed limits um, and the functional classification of the road. Um, and what we ended up doing, and I think this is fairly standard practice, is looking at particular times of day that are known to not be congested. So maybe 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, on a weekday is less likely to be congested than say right at rush hour or right at lunchtime. So we can basically use those as a proxy for free, free flow speed. So essentially we took that data, used that as the target for uh, our model that is going to be making predictions based on the imagery. Um, so that seems like something that we might not need to do because we already have this free flow speed data available to us. Why bother with the image component? But what's the, the limitation with this approach with the GPS data is that, you know, there will be lots of segments of road that don't have a lot of people driving on them, right? And so you'd like to be able to, you know, aggregate information about how people drive across a large area. Even if you don't have somebody drive on this particular segment of road, you'd still like to be able to predict how fast they drive, or how fast somebody might drive. Um, so we built a data set, um, basically combining a couple of uh, different sources of data that's available from the state, from this Kentucky from above program. So the imagery is from the National Agricultural Imagery Program, NAEP. Um, so that's available across the state. It's fairly easy to, to download. Um, and then there's a statewide airborne LIDAR data set that's continually being um, added to and improved um, and so that's that's what this is here. So basically what we're going to try to do is combine the overhead imagery and the LIDAR point cloud of a particular area um, to make these predictions of free flow speeds. So we sampled 1.3 million um, locations across the state. Uh, we split the data set up by counties where we, we tried to get a sort of a nice distribution of counties. So we have some urban and some rural counties. Um, and, and so that's why we kind of have slightly strange numbers for training, validation, and testing, uh, just because we split based on counties to have some diversity, um, diversity there. Um, at the right here, you can see the, the free flow speed distributions for the city of, of Lexington. So you can see the interstate coming over here is this dark blue and some of the you know, more inner city roads here going, you know, so they're white, people can't drive quite as fast on those as they can say around New Circle or Man of War or um, I-75. Okay, so we did some initial work um, with a very, fairly simple architecture. We have the you know, satellite image that comes in, uh, you know, a CNN to extract features. We also include the roadway features as part of the input and then a very simple dense, you know, just another layer there to make a free flow speed prediction. So this was one of the first things that we did just to, to see what was possible as a baseline. Um, and one of the things that we don't like about this is that it requires these roadway features to be available, which is, as I said, are not always available. Um, so one of our goals here was to try to um, get rid of that component. Um, and so we ended up, you know, settling on this architecture, we call this raster net. Um, but, you know, essentially what this does is it's a, a network that allows us to take in the overhead image. And this is an image encoder. This is just a CNN. Um, and then taking the point cloud of that same area through a point cloud enclosure encoder. Um, and this, you know, there are a variety of different architectures for this. Um, I believe we used a point net for this, this particular paper, um, but there's similar to um, CNNs for images. There's been a lot of innovation in architectures for point clouds over the last few years. Um, and the, the one sort of thing that we were, I think that the, the thing that we had to be careful about is that we'd like to combine these two things, but the point cloud is sort of randomly sampled points and the overhead image is a nice dense raster grid. So the, the thing that we did was to determine the geographic location for every feature that we get out of the overhead image, go back, find the point cloud that surrounds that, push that through a neural network, this point cloud encoder so then we get a dense grid of point cloud features. 
Um, and so that allows us to then just concatenate the image features and the point cloud features. So we have for a particular location in the world, we have image features that help describe it and point cloud features that help describe it. Um, and then the rest of that is fairly standard, um, you know, some sort of um, averaging and prediction. So these are the results from the method. Um, in this case, we're defining accuracy as is the predicted value of free flow speed within five miles per hour of the true free flow speed for that segment. And so here we can see a variety of different accuracy numbers for different models. And I'll kind of break these down into different pieces. So here is the original, from the original paper, the image only model. So this is taking an older architecture that just takes in the satellite image, not the roadway features. We get, you know, close to 38, or I guess 37.6% accuracy. If we just improve the CNN that we're using, in this case to switch to a ResNet, we get up to 42% accuracy. So just that change to the baseline feature extractor gets us a big bump in accuracy. Um, so if we look at these three results, I think it's kind of interesting. So we can see that if we just look at the roadway features by themselves, Without looking at the image, we only get 40% accuracy. It's actually better than just using the image by itself, um, but but still, um, you know, it leaves some on the table. Where where if we include the images and the roadway features, we get up to close to 50% um, accuracy. So this is the the older work, um, and notice that if we just look at the new architecture again, here it doesn't do as well as the image plus the roadway features. Um, so here is where you know we're, we're comparing this previous approach that used the image and the roadway features, and essentially this rasternet learn says let's replace the roadway features with the point cloud information. So we get you know better performance out of this approach without having to have any of those manually annotated um, pieces of extra information. So this is you know wide area coverage of point cloud data. Um, and satellite imagery that's readily available uh, that we can pass into our model. Uh, this is an example, sort of a qualitative visualization of the best performing method um, for Lexington and um, the surrounding areas. So you can see here, the, in this case, red represents a faster road. And so you can see the interstate highways here, the downtown core where people are driving slower. And then here are predicted speeds um, from that model. And, and one thing that we, I, I regret that we didn't do when we had all this data sitting around and available is, is fill in the missing values here. So we could actually, we could make these predictions for every single segment of road, which we can't hear. You can see there's missing segments here. So we don't know what the speed is here because we didn't have somebody driving there that we could get a prediction. So, okay. So that's what I wanted to present. Um, you know, the summary is that we have, you know, shown that we can take these fundamental tasks that impact, you know, how safe a particular segment of road is that will provide useful data for, you know, a transportation agency making policy decisions about, you know, where to improve things, uh, where to change things. Um, and, you know, see a number of different avenues for future work that I'm interested in. Um, but, you know, kind of this is a, project a little bit on a pause right now. Um, but anyway, that's that's that. I wanted to acknowledge, you know, I had a number of different um, former PhD students involved in this um, project, as well as William and Armin, who are the leads on, on these projects. Um, and also thanks, you know, to great collaborators at the Kentucky Transportation Center and the ability to have access to the data, which made all of this possible. Um, so with that, I will, um, Stop talking. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, it looks like there's uh, one question for you in the chat. Okay, let's see if I can find that. It basically, it's uh, if all the training data is from Kentucky, will it be accurate for other states like Ohio or California? Yeah, so. <clears throat> I mean, I think there will be elements that transfer better to other states, um, but you know there are things that change from from state to state based on you know local laws, for example. 
you know, people might be less likely to, to drive fast in certain places. So there is sort of, there's an element of, of that that won't transfer nicely. Um, but a lot of the, you know, as long as the, the image data was collected in a standardized way um, and across that whole area, I think it's going to work reasonably well outside of those sorts of um, differences in just local culture. Um, but we, you know, and the, the evaluation, you know, somewhat reflects that because we, you know, we, we have held out counties that we're evaluating on. Um, and so it's not, you know, quite as diverse as going from Kentucky to Ohio or, you know, you know, Kentucky to Arizona or California, you know, I think the model would struggle to, to transfer and work well in those areas because the, you know, the vegetation looks different, the, you know, just the, the general color palette of the area is very different because, um, you know, there's less rain, for example. So, you know, you, you do want to have a diversity of training data from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, one of the things that we ran into for early versions of this model was that we were dramatically oversampled in um, urban areas. So we had lots of urban area data. And so making sure that we weren't biased and making good predictions in urban areas and terrible predictions in rural areas was something that we, we sort of factored in as well. So that there are lots of questions like that. And I think, you know, if you really were to deploy something like this, you want to be really careful about the design of, you know, what data set you collect, how you assess whether it's really generalizing well. Um, and that's a, that's a big complicated um, long-term process. And we had another question that came in. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, for point cloud data, do you think graph-based neural network would work? Um, sure. So, so graph-based neural networks. Um, yeah. So there, there are lots of different architectures. I mean, I th when I think about graph neural networks um, for point clouds, I am, you know, that there isn't an inherent graph structure to them um, because, you know, they're essentially just scattered points that, that you could build a graph from that by looking at sort of K nearest neighbors or something along those lines. Um, but it isn't something that's inherently a graph. And so I, my intuition would be that, you know, you, you could use graph-based approach, you know, graph-based networks um, and it might work well, but it's not, you know, inherently going to work better in my opinion than something that, you know, just, takes advantage of the fact that in, in this case, in this app, you know, for point clouds that we're working with, you know, they, they have sp the spatial coordinates that come with them. So it's not like, uh, you know, I think graph neural networks are really useful for places where you don't have spatial coordinates that, that come along with the data. Um, you know, I, I have seen work that, you know, looks at images and tries to do image understanding with a graph neural network by saying, you know, you're four connected. So do your upper and lower, you know, left, right, and up, down neighbors, you know, we can build a graph out of that. So, so you can do that and you can show that it works about as well, but I think you, you lose some uh, computational advantage and you're, you know, maybe doing it, you know, using more general approach than you need because it uh, is using the graph structure as opposed to the spatial coordinates. And uh, from the same, um, person, he asked, how do you determine the weights among the three lost terms in the first part of the talk? Sure. So um, in the end, that's a, that's the function of the validation set. Um, you know, this is where one of the, the, the secrets here is that you need to be able to train a lot of models and evaluate them. And so, you know, essentially you you take your training set, you split off a small piece of that as validation. Ideally, the difference between the training and validation set looks like the difference between the training and test set. Um, and so then you, you basically just, you know, there's a number of different approaches to this, but you could just grid samples. So try 10 different values for parameter one, 10 different values for parameter two, and 10 for parameter three, right? So then you have 10 times 10 times 10 different models that you need to train, train those on the training set and, and then evaluate those on the validation set and pick the best one. Then go back and train that on the full training set uh, with training and validations are combined and evaluate that on the test set. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, I honestly don't remember what we did in this 
uh, for this particular work. Um, there's a number of different approaches. You can do random sampling um, over the space of parameters. You can do a grid search, um, or you can do some like Bayesian optimization approaches. There are nice large scale industrial quality um, libraries that, that support that. Thank you for that. Th yeah, those questions came from uh, Professor Ch Ch Chung. Um, we have another question from Nathan Russell. Do you have a recommendation for someone wanting to learn how to apply machine learning to courses, books, papers, websites, etc.? I have worked in industry um, actuary type work where machine learning was considered a strong area for a few years, uh, a, a strong area a few years ago. I would like to learn more about the topic and its association with statistics, particularly cluster analysis, factor analysis, principal component analysis, et cetera. Do you have any? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, there's, there's a several parts of learning how to do something new, right? Um, you know, I, mean, I think it's certainly important, you know, to look at some of the classes that are offered here at UK. Um, you know, there, you know, there's the computer science, uh, CS460G, um, you know, which gives you sort of a basic machine learning coverage. There's, you know, a natural language processing <clears throat> course that I often recommend in biomedical informatics. Um, there's a couple of classes um, in the math department that are great. Um, and so I think, you know, seeing a, a broad range of those, those sorts of classes um, is really useful. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think coming at it from the other direction, I think it's really useful just to get your hands dirty and pick a task, pick a data set, um, and try to try to do something with it. Um, and it's often really useful to start from, you know, looking at, you know, go look at papers with code and see what the state of the art is on some task that sounds interesting to you. Try to, you know, see if you can get that code even running to do inference and try to run it on a new uh, you know, new input to see how it works. And so, you know, I th think digging into just getting things running. So I, I tend to be like a, you know, I think everybody will give you a slightly different flavor of this, but I tend to be a, you know, a, a software first kind of um, person from this perspective. So I'd like to just get in there and try to run some things and see what happens. And then, then try to understand what I don't know um, after I start from there. So I don't know, a little bit of meandering, uh, description, but I'm happy to chat about that further offline. All right. Well, thank you for your time today. And uh, for everyone else uh, and Dr. Jacobs, be sure to join us next Wednesday at the same time. Um, and you can find out about the, uh, the upcoming Keeping Current sessions on the Keeping Current website, as well as watch some videos of the old ones. And uh, um, see all the stuff that we've kept current on. <laughs> Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. Thanks.